and to rejoice and come in. We come together this morning by the light of the chalice flame. Please join us in our chalice lighting words. And if you are joining us this morning on Zoom, we invite you to light a candle or chalice at home along with us. We light this flame as a symbol of new life enlightening our way, as a symbol of the warmth in every human heart. The lighting of this flame rekindle in us the inner light of hope, of peace, of love. May we share that light with all people. Today is also the third Sunday of Advent, so we will light all three candles, including the Rose Joy Candle, in honor of the Christian season of waiting for Christmas. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we are so glad to welcome you to the Fox Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship this morning, whether you're joining us here in the room or from your home. My name is Patrick Mitchell, and I've been a fellowship member since the mid-2000s. I'm currently on my second year on the board, first year as, your, as a fellowship treasurer, and as, as well as being on the audit committee and the generosity ministries team. If this is your first time visiting the fellowship, I want to extend to you a special welcome. I joined the fellowship in the mid-2000s. During my first visit to the fellowship, I was impressed with relaxed, relaxed and open environment and Reverend Roger Birchhausen's sermon. And as I attended more services, I came to realize that the fellowship was a place for me. And why was that? First, because a fellowship is inclusive, progressive, and willing to confront hard issues. They were on a leading edge for gay rights in the Fox Valley before it was popular. The same with LBGTQ and Black Lives Matter. That took a lot of courage. Second, because a fellowship helps me grow. It helps broaden my horizons and be more aware and accepting. I like that I can be on my own journey and follow my own path there's no straight dogma or to fo follow or feel guilty about. Third is because of the fellowship ministers, and they are wise beyond their years, in my opinion. From Reverend Roger Birchhausen to Reverend Christina Leon Tracy and all the others in between, they all make me think. Because of these reasons is why I stay, I stay at the fellowship and why I volunteer at the fellowship and last, why I financially support the fellowship. And I would ask you to join with me to keep the fellowship a vibrant community. It takes volunteers and financial donations, so please consider giving. Paraphrasing the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, story Jimmy Stewart, this town needs this fellowship if only to have some place where people can come find a progressive community where you're allowed to follow your own path. With that said, if you are new here, our Director of Congressional, Congregational Life, Marie Luna, would love to get you, would help, love to help you get you connected. Feel free to chat at, with her after service or send her an email. It's time now to settle in, take a deep breath, become aware of your body wherever you are. Allow yourself to come into the sanctuary so you can be fully present to this time together. It's good to be together. Thank you, Pat. We are gathered in this space this morning. We are also gathered from online, and we want to take a moment to greet each other. If you are joining us by Zoom, I invite you to turn your camera on. 
so that in a moment when we show your face on the screen, we can all see your beautiful faces and wave to you. Those of you who are here in the sanctuary, if you are able to wave, kind of turn toward the center, and that way we can see, every, everybody can see us at home. We're so happy to have you. Yay! It's, you know, when you're home on Zoom, you just see a bunch of squares. <laughs> so it's nice to see that there are actual humans here. Yeah. And there's our people from home. We're so glad to see you. Glad that you are joining us this morning. So now that we have gathered, we have our call to gather, which is adapted from the 20th century UU minister, the Reverend A. Powell Davies. When I indicate like this, your response is, we need each other. Let's try that. We need each other. None of our private worlds is big enough to live a wholesome life in. We need the wider world of joy and wonder, of purpose and adventure, toil and tears. We need each other. What are we, any of us, but strangers and sojourners, forlornly wandering through the nighttime until we draw together and find the meaning of our lives in one another? dissolving our fears in each other's courage, making music together and lighting torches to guide us through the dark. We need each other. Love is what we need, to love and be loved. Let our hearts be open, and what we would receive from others, let us give. For what is given still remains to bless the giver when the gift is love. We need each other. We, as Unitarian Universalists, strive to encourage a spiritual stance of abundance, rejecting a scarcity mindset. We take time each week for this moment of practice, to take stock of what we have, cultivating peace when we need to ask for support, and giving with joy whatever we are able to offer. For those of you who would appreciate some support, we are here to help. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Reverend Christina or Minister Alley if you are in need of financial or emotional support. It is a joy for us to be able to offer help on behalf of this beloved community. And if you are someone who is feeling stable and able to give, we ask that you do so in the spirit of abundance. There are many ways to give to the fellowship. You can give of your time and talent, and we especially need financial resources to allow our ministries to thrive for the months and years to come. And if you are here in our sanctuary, you can come up to one of our offering baskets, which our ushers are holding near the back of the sanctuary, or you can raise your hand if you want an usher to come to you. Anyone can also donate online or via our text to give function on a smartphone. Thank you. Your gifts are deeply appreciated. Please join in our next song. It's number 362, Rise Up, O Flame. We'll sing it three times. Rise up, O flame, by thy light glowing, show to us beauty, vision, and joy. Rise up. beauty, vision, and joy. 
Our reading this morning is entitled, Bringing My Whole Self, by Takia Amin, from the 2019 edition of the Unitarian Universalist Pocket Guide. She writes, I discovered Unitarian Universalism for myself at the age of 14, and it felt like something I'd created out of a dream. As a teen from a multi-faith family, it was critical for me to be in a community where I could bring the best of what I valued from my Christian and Muslim heritage. I was looking for a faith that could bear the full weight of my beliefs, my doubts, my aspirations, and my questions, without forcing me into a narrow framework of what I was supposed to think or be. I am a black, working-class, cisgender woman, born and raised in an economically depressed city close to the Canadian border. These things don't speak to the entirety of who I am, but they are huge pieces of my identity and have shaped in many ways how I live, work, dream, build, and move in the world. I am as proud of these indelible marks on my humanity as I am on my personal achievements and professional accomplishments. And when I walk into any space, all of who I am comes with me, full and rich and ready. When I entered Unitarian Universalism, I brought my full self to this living tradition. Unitarian Universalism, this bright, vibrant and heretical faith, doesn't promise to have all the answers. I have sometimes envied folks in other faith communities who have a neatly tied up set of dogmas to align themselves with, even though I know that's not what my soul or my intellect really craves. When we are at our best, Unitarian Universalists are people who will hold you and sustain you while you are living the questions about who you truly believe and how to live that out in the world. Takia Amin continues, As a living tradition, I am glad to be in a faith community that isn't closed. While our faith is rooted in centuries-old religious perspectives and practices, new interpretations of what it means to live out this tradition as people of color, as people on the margins, as people committed to global justice in increasingly complex circumstances are emerging and being articulated in new and exciting ways. We are a faith that is both deeply rooted and reaching toward the future as we ask ourselves what it means to be you, you in the world now, to bring justice now, to be bearers of the heavy weight of democratic consciousness now. The answers, multivalent and diverse, reside in our very lives. So we do well to bring our full selves to bear on this tradition. What I know is that in Unitarian Universalism, we are better because of who we are together and at our best when we hold the complexity that community provides as a reminder of the holy. It is for these reasons that I do not hold back, hide myself or shrink as a member of this broadly diverse faith community and I encourage others to do the same. I don't want any of us to miss out on the beauty that each of us brings to this space. We take it as a given in this tradition that yes, we are all different in our experiences of the holy and because of that, we have the blessing of learning from each other as we wrestle with the tension of how to live in full, equitable, right relationship with each other this faith has made me better, and I hope that at my best, I have enriched this tradition too. I believe our faith is made better by everyone who chooses to embrace its challenges and invitations, contradictions and possibilities. This faith is made better by everyone who touches it with their lives.
So y'all that have known me a long time, this is the first time I ever asked Tom for help on a song, so. <coughs> Just so you know. Light the chalice, let it shine. It lights the search for freedom, the seal that saved the children. We share this cup with everyone. In the 1400s, the priest John Hus was the first to share the chalice of truth. He gave his life to share this sacred wine. Light the chalice. the search for freedom, the zeal that saved the children. We share this cup with everyone. During the Second World War, the shops made away with the seal so the children could sail to safety in their new homeland. Light the chalice, let it shine. for freedom, the seal that saved the children, we share this cup with everyone, inspired by the risks they took, we're challenged to look into our own lives, and give them to something that matters more than safety. Let it shine Lights a search for freedom The seal that saved the children We share this cup with everyone Light the chalice Let it shine The year 1989 was an auspicious year, a transformative year in my life. That year I married my wife, Mary, in the Catholic Church, left my job in journalism, started working in human services, moved from Milwaukee to Appleton, and discovered the Unitarian Universalist faith. At the age of 24, with youthful exuberance, I was ecstatic to find this faith. You mean you don't have to be certain about Christianity or God in general, and you can still be a good person? My first Appleton job, where my wife and I ran a group home for a Christian nonprofit organization, was a great place to post my Unitarian Universalist principles. This is so obvious, I thought. I'm sure this is actually what everyone believes. Shortly afterward, a coworker scolded me for so boldly posting my religious beliefs on the refrigerator in the kitchen of the group home. Well, apparently this isn't for everyone, I guess. I was spreading the good news of inherent worth and dignity, acceptance, and the flaming chalice, but I forgot for a second that my cool new belief system wasn't just right for everyone. While inclusivity got my attention, it has more often been the risky, even radical side of Unitarian Universalism that has kept me involved for 32 years. The radically inclusive spirit of our human justice-seeking mission 
captured in the rich history of our flaming chalice, has seeped, sometimes overflowed, into my daily life. Unlike Jan Hus, the Roman Catholic leader branded a heretic, whom we will learn more about soon, my active, rapid embrace of our faith didn't put me at risk of being burned at the stake. But it has offered a glowing light of comfort and a spiritual exhortation to stand out, to stand up, to say something, to listen to previously muffled voices, and to seek to make a difference in big ways or small. One of the things that initially struck me and still holds the day is our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. As I immersed myself more and more in the fellowship, and early on became a worship leader, we called it something else back then, I began taking risks to stand up for inclusion because I was emboldened by Unitarian Universalism. Long before there was marriage equality, our fellowship initiated the Welcoming Congregation Program. We brought a guest speaker who shared his experience as a man with HIV and we presented a Sunday morning program proudly proclaiming that love is love. Years later, longtime fellowship member Chester Bankey thanked me for my part in that, but it seemed so natural. It was simply who we Unitarian Universalists were, and certainly still are, holding up the inherent worth and dignity of all people. The idea still fills my cup and the chalice, the healing cup, that first sign of refuge to those escaping Nazi persecution is the symbol of radical inclusion that keeps me grounded in my faith. I want to start by thanking Scott for serving as a worship leader today. He's doing a fabulous job, and this is his first time since he was a worship leader back in the 90s. Things have changed a little bit, right, Scott? Yeah. <laughs> and I also want to thank Ty Alford for that beautiful song that he wrote specifically for this morning's service. Like Scott, when I first found Unitarian Universalism, I was also smitten and excited about what I had found. I recall becoming quite the UU evangelist on my Northeast Texas college campus. I printed out one page sheets all about Unitarian Universalism and I would keep them in my backpack and hand them to anyone who had any slight remote passing interest. <laughs> I, too, was drawn to our seven principles, especially that first principle of inherent worth and dignity of every person. At that time in my life, I had recently emerged out of a fundamentalist faith, and I recalled the harm to my spirit that had been done by many of the messages that I had received in that faith. I was so glad to have the openness and freedom and affirmation of the UU tradition. I reveled in my new awareness of my enoughness. I was being taught in my church that I was enough to God, to my faith community, and increasingly to myself. What a beautiful gift. After college, I attended graduate school in Memphis, Tennessee, and it was there that I became very active in a small UU congregation. After I had been there for one year, their longtime minister retired. We then had a one-year interim minister, and then our new minister, fresh from seminary, arrived. He had a new way of doing things, and he challenged our congregation to try new things too. It was then, at the ripe age of 25, that I became the chair of the Religious Education Committee in the midst of this ministry transition, and at the same time, I was wrestling with my own calling to ministry. 
This new minister was a mentor for me in both of these roles, helping me learn what UU faith community was all about. I remember one lunch when he asked me to begin examining my own privilege and to start thinking about Unitarian Universalism through a justice-making lens. It's likely that at the time, my eye roll was audible. <laughs> Why do we have to do all that, I asked. Isn't it enough to be a spiritual community for seekers, helping to comfort and affirm them? After all, that is what I had needed when I found Unitarian Universalism. And several years later, I had not stretched much past that. The minister was kind and assured me that we would always have that as a part of our role, but that it's never enough for a faith community, especially a UU one, to be insular and focused only on ourselves. Last week, we did a whole service here focusing on the UU Flaming Chalice, the history of the Unitarian Service Committee, or the USC, during World War II. I told the story of Martha and Wait Still Sharp, the two figures who were much of the energy behind the earliest days of the USC, and how their work in Czechoslovakia and later in Portugal helped to bring hundreds of people, including many, many children, to safety out of Nazi-occupied areas. It was during that time and that powerful and risky work that the Unitarian Service Committee hired an artist named Hans Deutsch to design a seal, a symbol, to put on their official documents their signage, packages, and other important things. He designed the flaming chalice as the symbol that we now call our UU chalice today. But it took decades for the symbol to transform from the symbol of the Unitarian Service Committee to the symbol of the Unitarian Church, and then later to become the symbol of the Unitarian Universalist Association, having at that time been placed off-center in two interlocking rings to show the merger of the Unitarians with the Universalists. And then, even later, children began to make three-dimensional chalices in their Sunday school programs. And when the children and youth would lead services in the sanctuary, they would bring their chalices with them, which captured the imagination of the adult congregation, who then began lighting flaming chalices in their services to mark sacred time together. If you missed last week's service, you can find it on our YouTube channel and learn more about the incredible history of our flaming chalice symbol and the bravery of the people who originated it. But one thing that stands out about this story is that no one really knows why Hans Deutsch created the flaming chalice as the symbol for the Unitarian Service Committee. We know that he did, and we know what happened next, but we don't know why he did it. There are no written records except a letter from Charles Joy, who was the president of the Unitarian Service Committee to Boston, to the uh, Unitarian office there, and he noted that it indicated some resemblance to monastic symbols, or the flaming lamps of the ancient and Greek ancient Greek and Roman temples. He also notes some resemblance of the chalice to a cross, which at the time, in the early 1900s, Unitarianism was still a Christian denomination, and the sacrificial love symbolized by the cross was one of the inspirations for that life-saving work of the service committee. But other than that, we don't really know. We don't know why Hans Deutsch drew that symbol. But one idea is that he was inspired by a 15th century Catholic priest named Jan Hus. It's spelled J-A-N, Jan, H-U-S, Hus. He was born in 1370. He became a Catholic priest and then the dean and rector of Charles University in Prague, 
that same city where centuries later one of the largest Unitarian churches ever would flourish and where the Unitarian Service Committee would begin its work. At that time, over a century before Martin Luther famously translated the scriptures into German and kicked off the Protestant Reformation, Jan Hus also was translating the Bible into the common language in his homeland of Bohemia. And he also preached to the common concerns of the people in common language. Eventually, for this, Hus was excommunicated from the church. But he had amassed a large enough following that he continued to preach and teach. At that time, in Catholic Mass, the communion bread, or the host, was given by the priest to the people. But the chalice, the wine, was kept only to be consumed by the priest himself. The people were not deemed worthy enough to receive the wine. But Hus believed and taught that the bread and wine were symbolic, that they didn't actually transform into the body and blood of Christ, and so he insisted on sharing both elements, the bread and the wine, with everyone who was gathered at Mass. For this and for other heresies, Hus was arrested, tried, and after being found guilty, he was put to death by being burned at the stake. For Jan Hus's followers, who became known as Husites, this was a tragedy. The chalice which he gave to everyone, merged with the flame of his sacrifice, became the symbol of a movement throughout Bohemia and Eastern Europe. It was worn on cloaks and battle armor for centuries. Sadly, this was a time of lots of religious war, and the Hussite wars are no different. But the message of Jan Hus was reborn a century later when the Reformation pushed for many of the things that he taught. The national motto of Czechoslovakia as far back as World War I, and even now today the motto of the Czech Republic, is truth prevails which it is said that Jan Hus shouted while he was being burned. He was known to have said during his life, seek the truth, hear the truth, learn the truth, love the truth, speak the truth, hold the truth and defend the truth until death. Now, since this symbol, this chalice with a flame inside, was already something that had existed in Europe, it's highly possible, and even likely, that Hans Deutsch knew about the Hussites and the flaming chalice in that context when he designed the symbol for the Unitarian Service Committee. Okay. Cool. So what, what does that have to do with us today? I love, I love a good history service, but what do we do with it? Last Sunday, I invited you to ponder what it must have felt like to be terrified, to worry about your own safety or your children's safety, and then to see the flaming chalice image of the Unitarian Service Committee, to imagine that symbol on paperwork that would grant your child safe passage to the United States or your own escape to a safe country. Today, I want us to ponder the symbol itself, as it is, a chalice, a cup, and a flame. If it has any reference at all to Jan Hus, and I think it does, that cup was something that was denied to the people that he believed that they deserved, that all people deserved it, not only a few select people, and that the flame, so warm and inviting, dancing in that cup, that it was actually the flame of sacrifice, a terrible, terrible sacrifice. But it was a risk that he willingly took to offer his faith to those on the margins, 
those that the powers that be said did not deserve it. The cup for everyone. The flame, a willing risk. Those of you that know me know that I love Unitarian Universalist history. I get really excited when I talk about it. And the reason is that if you follow Unitarian history all the way back from the year 325, it's kind of like a tree. It just branches off over and over again. When the church is going along this way, there's eventually some kind of schism, and those who are deemed heretics go this way, and the rest of the church continues along, and then there's another schism and another... Unitarians are basically the people who always, at every fork in the road, were the heretics. <laughs> and we weren't just the heretics because we liked to be anti-authoritarian, though that was probably part of it. We were the heretics because we were often on the leading edge of what it meant to be more open, more flexible, more welcoming in our theology than what the larger church was willing to be. This was the risk that our religious ancestors took over and over again to create and share a faith that was expansive, not limiting. And this is what they handed down to us, a Unitarian Universalism that is for everyone, a comfort and a gift and an affirmation for everyone, like the cup that Jan Hus believed that everyone deserved. Takiya Amin, in the reading we heard earlier, says, quote, As a living tradition, I'm glad to be in a faith community that isn't closed. While our faith is rooted in centuries-old religious perspectives and practices, new interpretations of what it means to live out this tradition as people of color, as people on the margins, as people committed to global justice and increasingly complex circumstances, are emerging and being articulated in new and exciting ways. We are a faith, she says, that is both deeply rooted and reaching toward the future. As we ask ourselves what it means to be you, you in the world now, to bring justice now, to be bearers of the heavy weight of democratic consciousness now. The answers, multivalent and diverse, reside in our very lives. So we do well to bring our full selves to bear on this tradition, end quote. Our ancestors passed this faith from one generation to the next until today, it's ours. And we're not done. Along the way, there have been bumps in the road. There have been times that we have failed to live up to the gift that our ancestors gave us. But then, Another brave generation comes along and tries to keep us on that path toward creating ever more expansive faith, more open to the experiences and stories and lives of those who have been shut out. That's why it's not enough for us to do what I wanted to do when I was 24 and I rolled my eyes at my minister, wondering why we couldn't simply be a spiritual community for seekers affirming and comforting. We can be that, and we should be that, and I hope that we are that. And, and, we are also a spiritual community who should offer ourselves to those who have not yet found us, who might need us, who might find in Unitarian Universalism a life-saving faith, and yet they've never heard of us. Or, worse. They have heard of us, but they think we are only that place where white folks go, who listen to NPR and drive Priuses. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not enough to only be welcoming to one kind of person. Many of us say, and I have said it too, that one of the reasons we love coming here is for the like-minded people. But the risk of like-mindedness is that it can be a comfort and a trap. It keeps us stuck in our sameness. We also need to reach out and offer ourselves to those who need us, even those who will never join us, 
the chalice cup is for everyone, not just those who will eventually sign our membership book. Our UU tradition has been at the crossroads before, the place of schism. And it's possible that we are there again today as a faith tradition. This generation is facing the challenge within ourselves about our collective call to be a multicultural and anti-racist religious organization. Some people find this threatening to what they originally loved about Unitarian Universalism, and they want to stay in that like-minded, like-experienced place. But some people, like Takia Amin and I, find this a refreshing continuation of our religious historical heritage. It's an expansion that can only lead to more openness, more sharing, and more heretical, expansive love. Amin says, quote, what I know is that in Unitarian Universalism, we are better because of who we are together, and we are at our best when we hold the complexity that community provides as a reminder of the holy. I'm going to say that again. We are better because of who we are together and at our best when we hold the complexity that community provides as a reminder of the holy. She continues, it's for these reasons that I do not hold back or hide myself or shrink as a member of this broadly diverse faith community, and I encourage others to do the same. I don't want any of us to miss out on the beauty that each of us brings to this space. We take it as a given in our tradition that, yes, we're all different in our experiences of the holy, and because of that, we have the blessing of learning from each other as we wrestle with the tension of how to live in full, equitable, right relationship with each other, end quote. As we do this wrestling, it won't always be easy. Everyone won't always be happy. But it is a risk that we need to take, a risk to push ourselves beyond the safe boundaries of where we are to the place where we might become. We are the religious descendants of those who took risks, like Jan Hus, far greater than the one that we are currently facing. No one will be burned at the stake for the risk that we take to become anti-racist. Really, there's only good to come from it. May we let the flame of our chalice light our way forward. As we say each week when we extinguish the chalice flame here at our fellowship, may we carry its light of compassion and commitment to build a better world. To build a better world. May it be so. And amen. Please join in singing our next song. It's 1028 in the Teal Hymnal, The Fire of Commitment.
of our commitment to each other is to bring our life transitions, our happy times, and our low moments to this time together so that our joys might be amplified and our sorrows comforted. For those of us joining in person, after the service, you can feel free to place a stone in our fellowship chalice as a symbol of our loving community surrounding you supportively. Or you can also join a member of our care team in the back of the sanctuary by the Bowl of Stones, who will be there to offer a listening presence. For those attending virtually, you can feel free to share in the chat box whatever joy, concern, or prayer request or intention might be on your heart and on your mind. We place a stone in our chalice now on your behalf. Today, we, we allow our mind and heart to reach out in ever-widening circles like ripples in water. For each stone that we place in our vessel of water, we name the joys and concerns in the larger community and in our wider world. Our first stone this morning is for our local community in the state of Wisconsin. This week we hold our overburdened hospitals and medical staff in our hearts and we pray each, we each might do our part to reduce the spread of COVID-19 through vaccination and mask wearing to lift the burden on our stressed system. We add another stone for the United States in particular, Kentucky, Arkansas, Illinois, Missouri, Mississippi, and Tennessee, after the devastating tornadoes that swept through this weekend. We hold in our hearts those who have lost their lives and all whose lives have been touched by this natural disaster in one way or another. We pray for relief. We pray for healing. We pray for comfort. And as those ripples continue in our water, we add our final stone for the wider world, a recognition of our interconnected, interconnection with those across borders and across oceans. This week, we hold the winners of the Nobel Peace Prize in our hearts, Philippine journalist Maria Ressa and Russian journalist Dmitry Muratov. In the spirit of Jan Hus's call to defend truth, we honor these two for their risky defense of truth in the face of authoritarianism and their call to free speech. We enfold all who are celebrating and all who are suffering in the embrace of our hearts and commit ourselves to acts of compassion and justice in service to those circles that are beyond our own. May this moment of silence help make it so.
our time together is coming to a close, which means our time to return to the world and our daily lives is beginning. Remember that there are always ways to get more connected here, both in person and online, and to live our faith more fully. Please be sure to read the weekly scroll email newsletter for more information, or let us know if you do not receive it so we can add you to that list. You can also check out your back of your order of service for some highlights of events that are coming up. Today, facilitators from our Heart to Heart Relationship Enrichment Retreat will have a table in our front lobby to answer questions and give more information about their weekend retreat coming up in November. Also, if you will be planning to attend our Christmas Eve services virtually, you can pick out some supplies outside of the front doors today. Now, as we prepare to leave this gathering, we invite you to think about what you want to take home with you, what lesson or idea or theme that you will carry with you from this time together back to your daily life. As you hold that in your heart, our hope is that it will serve as inspiration and empowerment for your week ahead. And now please join me in our unison words for extinguishing our chalice flame, even as we continue to hold its warmth and light in our hearts. As we extinguish this flame, let us go our ways with hope in our hearts, with our spirits renewed, and with a deeper understanding of life's mystery. Let us carry the light of compassion and commitment to build a better world. After these closing words, we will hear a postlude song. We invite those of you who want to, to stay here in the sanctuary or on Zoom for a time of sharing and conversation. Everyone else is welcome to use that time to make your way out of the room. Go in courageous love, reaching out to those beyond your circle. Go in peace knowing we wait to embrace you upon your return. Mm -hmm.